you got our gentlemen lined up for this evening's round table. Starting off from the lower left, Daniel McAdams, Ron Paul Institute, Scott Horton, antiwar.com, Cal Mullinay, Air Force vet, as well as founder of Liberate RVA, and Justin there in the lower right, Air Force veteran and conscientious objector. Gentlemen, thank you so much for coming on KF. So I'll start with you, Daniel. Somber occasion, the 18th memorial of uh, 9-11. For me, though, it kind of marks a separate occasion. Moving forward from here on out, any 18-year-old who uh, decides to enlist in the military will have been born after the pretense for endless war. So uh, I want to kind of get your thoughts on the cost of war, the financial, the humanitarian, the psychological costs that Americans have endured over the last almost 18 years. Well, you know, to start out, it is, it is the anniversary, and it's, it's really odd when I think back to it because I was literally there. I felt the impact at the Pentagon. I lived about a half a mile away. Uh, we were on the top floor of our condo, and we have a skylight. So when the, when the engine, when the airplane roared overhead, it literally darkened our apartment for a brief period, for a brief second. Uh, and I could hear the engines revving at absolutely full speed. And I knew something was really very wrong. I thought it was a rocket uh, or some kind of bomb. And I felt it's, it, it hitting. And we went and looked out the bathroom window and we saw a huge cl- uh, cloud of smoke. And we went and we went over by the uh, Pentagon row on a hill and watched the Pentagon burn. So it is very uh, poignant uh, for me personally and for my family. My son uh, was just about a year and a half old at the time. And now, as you very well point out, uh, he is of military age, although uh, he won't be going into the military as long as I'm as long as I'm breathing, unfortunately. Uh, But the cost of war is an important thing. And the first thing I do when I think about the cost of war is I get pragmatic and I go to the Brown University's Watson uh, Institute and their project on the cost of war. And I don't want to steal anyone's thunder, but let's throw out a couple of statistics uh, from their very excellent, excellent work. $5.9 trillion spent through uh, November of 2018 on the post 9-11 wars. Direct death toll, 480,000 as of November 2018. 244,000 civilians directly killed by this war. 21 million refugees have been made. Uh, The U.S. military is active in counter-terror operations in 80 countries worldwide. This is where we sit 18 years after 9-11. Scott, your reaction to Daniel's observations? Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, I think the most important points here are, first of all, that America started it. And the major myth undermining this whole thing is just like in the TV footage that the attack came out of the clear blue sky. And so, you know, it's open to interpretation. But the real truth is, as and I think most people know this who know really anything about foreign policy at all. They know this, but maybe just don't hear it put together like this very simply that Jimmy Carter and Ronald Reagan backed these guys, then Bush Sr. and Bill Clinton betrayed them. In fact, Bill Clinton kept backing them the whole time he was betraying them too. And they attacked us all through the 1990s, starting at the First World Trade Center attack and all through the 90s. And they made very clear that, first of all, their motivation was American combat forces stationed in Saudi Arabia in order to bomb and blockade Iraq and the endless Iraq War one and a half of the later Bush senior years and through the entire Bill Clinton years and American support for Israel, as well as American support for all the dictators in the region, keeping them out of power. And that was why they attacked us. And then the strategy was to give George Bush and Dick Cheney a crisis to exploit. They saw Bush as the perfect mark. And so when Daniel goes through and lists these costs of war, you have to understand, Bin Laden, he was not some caveman from the town of Bedrock, you know, out there, some hillbilly redneck like the Taliban Pashtuns of Afghanistan. He is the son of a billionaire and an engineering student. His family was like the Rockefellers of Saudi Arabia. He was a very sophisticated guy. And what he said over and over again before the September 11th attack, leading up to the September 11th attack, was we are going to do to you what you helped us 
us do to the Soviet Union in Afghanistan in the Reagan years. We're going to bog you down and bleed you to bankruptcy and force your empire out of our part of the world the hard way, because that's the only way you'll learn, just like the USSR. And we're going to break you. And so, hey, takes a uh, got to break a few eggs to make an omelet was essentially bin Laden's point of view that however many Afghans had to die or other Middle Easterners and, and Muslims had to die in this war. They'll all go to heaven anyway if they're true believers. Oh, well. But over the long haul, it'll break the American empire and the price, as Madeleine Albright would say, would be worth it. And so here we are 20 years into the Americans playing exactly into bin Laden's script. And again, and I want to be clear, because that's not to say that they're fools and that bin Laden just hoodwinked them. It's that they are sick, evil, criminal, murderer, exploiters of tragedy who would, just as bin Laden said, take every opportunity to get away with everything they could and no one would benefit except them and a few politically connected corporations at the expense of the people of the Middle East and the people of the United States of America. And so all those costs of war is essentially this self-inflicted wound that you could say, you know, I don't want to say he tricked Bush into giving America, but that he gave America, he's like Jack Kevorkian, here's everything you need to kill yourself in one big murder suicide attack America just like Al Qaeda and take yourself out on the way. Cal if you didn't feel uh, the way Scott feels <laughs> right now you probably never would have joined the air force you know uh, what what prompted you to do that and uh, what do you think about it now you know that you're a true libertarian? Well I joined uh, one year after the attacks um, I was in high school and uh, I guess I felt a uh, sense of duty to do it the whole um, Starship Troopers sort of thing. Um, and I guess in, in a lot of the ways, Scott is right. Um, in some of the ways, I think uh, we have been tricked into procuring some of these costs. I mean, there has been this, this White House briefing in terms of like the Taliban offering Osama bin Laden saying, we have him, you know, if uh, we have the evidence, uh, we'll put him up to a third impartial court uh, to, to look at this, uh, the evidence against that and weigh it. And they offered it to give them up uh, twice. And this is during the, um, when the bombings are starting to occur. And you could see then that uh, during that White House briefing where they didn't want to answer that question, that this didn't really particularly had much to do anymore with Osama bin Laden. There's a lot more nefarious plans uh, at bay here. Um, interestingly though, in the military, uh, probably like in the third year in, that a lot of my fellow, uh, I guess veterans now, um, were looking into a lot of these 9-11 uh, conspiracies, documentaries, and a lot of the stuff started making them question uh, what they're doing in the military. Started to question uh, the government, like could their government uh, be hiding stuff from them? Could they have been, in a way, of course, you know, uh, those were hijackers. Those were from from the Middle East, Saudi Arabia. Most of them, um, they did do those things. Uh, but were, are there a possibility of there being some assistance along the way of letting that happen? Uh, much like. Uh, Japan did do those things at uh, Pearl Harbor, but was there much of a way of assistance of like pushing out your aircraft carriers um, and knowing ahead of time that these for attacks were imminent and incoming and in a way to kind of get into a war. And it's so much what we've seen so far uh, in the past that the government has done that before. Uh, why wouldn't it also continue the same pattern of behavior to uh, trick us into getting another war in which uh, the cost has been uh, incalculable? And Calculul is right. Justin Pavoni, thanks for uh, joining us. I've had the privilege of hearing your wife speak at probably the first Ron Paul event in uh, yeah, the swamp here. <laughs> yeah, here in the swamp. So uh, just for the the viewers and listeners who don't know you, explain your story and uh, how you've come to be where you are today. Right. Yeah. So my name is Justin Pavoni. Um, my wife and I were Air Force officers. We were uh, F-15E for myself and U-28 for Jessica pilots. Uh, both went to the academy and we got out after about 10 years. Uh, after about a year long process going through the conscientious objector uh, process, we ended up actually not being accepted as COs um, because my beliefs are moral and they didn't qualify uh, under a religious exemption. Um, so I guess you're, it's a little bit tougher if you're agnostic. But um, anyway, we ended up getting out administratively, thank God, after a, a pretty long struggle. Uh, in the military. And then um, Jess and I have just been working as entrepreneurs for the last five years, trying to make up for some of the malinvestment that we made in our earlier 
uh, days. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, working for the state in its ridiculous and uh, completely unnecessary wars of aggression. And uh, so we're trying to make up for lost time by uh, growing food and building houses and selling houses and doing things that people actually need in the real world. So that's our background. We live in the Bay Area, San Francisco now. And uh, yeah, we're just trying to spread the good word about liberty and peace and being decent to your fellow human being. That's a great way to put it, you know, using an Austrian term like malinvestment to refer to your career in the military. Uh, Daniel, you know, you deal with this every day. I'm sure you've met a lot of people along the way, maybe even managed to convert some so folks. But just talk about some of the, the humanitarian and psychological impact that you've seen as a result of these endless wars. I mean, it's just a tr a tr not only a tragedy. I mean, I've got a very good friend who lost his brother over in Iraq. But uh, even if folks are able to make it back, they're damaged permanently for life. I was watching a commercial the other night and, uh, you know, wounded warrior or something like that. All these guys are missing limbs. And, you know, I have a relative who's a boomer. And I said, you know, yep, totally worth it sarcastically. And they're like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, you're right. And I'm like, no, I, I was joking. Like, this is a terrible tragedy. So kind of, uh, you know, if you're, you're talking to somebody out there and you're trying to convey to them just how bad this has been, what do you say? Well, you know, the problem is that American exceptionalism has become kind of a uh, postmodern religion in the United States. It's a, it's a religion of self-worship where we believe we're somehow we've become gods. Uh, and it's really destructive. And it's uh, really the uh, to carry the metaphor a little further. The ceremony is violence. Uh, and that's it's 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 a damaging and horrific thing. We talked we did a show a couple of a few days ago about uh, military suicides, uh, 20 per day. And that's horrible. And it's terrible what a lot of people that have been duped, a lot of good folks who thought they were doing the right thing, who have been propagandized by the mainstream media uh, to believe that they were protecting America. And you can't blame all of these people, although they probably should know better by now. Uh, however, you can't blame them for, for wanting to do what they think is the right thing. And what they do is they get caught up in a, in a, in a horrible global war. The, you know, the war on terror, we don't talk about that much anymore since the 2018 new uh, U.S. Uh, uh, national security strategy just <laughs> went back to the Cold War and said Russia and China are our new enemies. Uh, that old war on terror thing, that's, 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 that's old news. Uh, however, as uh, Jim Bovard posted today on Facebook, uh, the war on terror is, you know, the greatest sham of our entire uh, political history. Uh, it was used by President Bush to launch a war on Iraq that had absolutely nothing to do with 9-11. It was used by President Obama to fund groups that were directly linked to al-Qaeda in Libya and Syria. Uh, it was used to uh, destroy our civil liberties at home and to desensitize us to the fact or to the idea that the government should have a right to look at our uh, personal phone calls, our text messages, to put their hands down our pants when we're trying to get on an airplane, to, to, to fondle our children when they're trying to get on an airplane, completely remaking U.S. society, completely desensitizing and psychologically conditioning U.S. society to be a society of psychological slaves to government, of slaves to governmental authority under the false idea that somehow this will make us safe, uh, which is itself become sort of a religious term. It's, it's, it's really a period of mass psychosis, a 20 year period of mass psychosis in our history that I frankly don't know how we're going to get out of, particularly as the mainstream media, its hold is slipping, but as it slips, it becomes more dangerous, uh, like a cornered uh, animal becomes more vicious. Yeah, this doesn't seem to be the country that I remember growing up in. Everything's way more intense. It's not as fun. Everyone's worried all the time. Scott, what's your reaction to what Daniel just said? Yeah, I mean, he's right. Uh, you know, again, back to bin Laden and his, you know, motives and strategy and all this is, you know, part of it, of course, is bogging America down, bleeding our empire to bankruptcy and forcing us out the hard way. But it was also in destabilizing the region on our way, destabilizing America's puppet dictators, radicalizing the populations of the Middle East in terms of religion and politics and every other thing. And this is beyond what America's done is beyond what bin Laden could have ever dreamed, not just setting off the massive sectarian war in Iraq War II, but then, as Daniel said, and this just can't be emphasized enough, 
just as Barack Obama is killing Osama bin Laden in May of 2011, he's taking his side in Libya and in Syria, and then later again, stabbing the Houthis, our allies in the back, and uh, taking Al Qaeda's side in Yemen in that war as well, beginning in 2015. And so, and this is all because essentially they're mad that they fought Iraq War II on behalf of the Shiites, Iran's friends. And so now they're trying to make up for that fact by backing Al Qaeda everywhere else in order to try to empower the Sunni kings and, and repay them uh, for the error of listening to the neocons and the Israelis in 2003. And so not only have they got, you know, a million plus people killed if you add these wars up um, and, you know, maybe even a million just in Iraq War II, depending on how you count them, uh, but certainly more than a million people killed. They've also set everything up for this war, even if America withdraws right now or if we stay uh, this war is going to continue for the rest of our lifetimes, most especially because of the way that Bush helped give Baghdad to the Shiites and helped the Shiite militias kick all the Sunnis out of Baghdad and give that city to the Shiites for the first time ever. And the Saudi Arabian kings will never accept that. And yet they can't do anything about it. It took the U.S. Army Marine Corps to make it that way. And so all they can do is fling suicide bombers at it from now on and back the Sunni insurgency in Western Iraq against the Shiite power there from now on for the rest of our lives. And there's no solution to it. And it's gonna keep on going, whether we have an outright bin Ladenite so-called Islamic state in Western Iraq or not, that's gonna ebb and flow. But that war is going to continue on. The Sunni based insurgency in Iraq is gonna last the rest of our lives. There's a tendency- George W. Bush and Barack Obama. Many thanks to them. There's a tendency, Cal, to call someone unpatriotic if you bring up some of the things that we're talking about tonight. You do plenty of man-on-the-street interviews. I've enjoyed many of them outside the White House and places like that. You have a unique perspective as well as you know your status as a vet. How, how do we change hearts and minds to maybe not go into the military? I, I think uh, going to the military, in a way, it's kind of a, in our culture. Um, I think our culture was susceptible for something for like a 9-11 attack to occur. We have a lot of holidays to kind of venerate and celebrate militarism, venturism. Uh, you have Memorial Day, you have Veterans Day. Holidays used to be called Armistice Day, right? Um, place of peace. Uh, you have uh, Independence Day. You have um, Sports Field, like in Chicago called Soldiers Field. Right. So we have uh, in their culture, it's it was, I would say, ripe to for our 9-11 to occur for our kind of uh, reaction to it to be very much a uh, gun ho Team America, uh, save the world sort of thing. Uh, so I think that's it's more than just trying to tell people not to join the military. I think it's a, a cultural thing that we kind of have to face and examine uh, and look around it because it's everywhere. <laughs> military Appreciation Day is pretty much every day if uh, and any kind of store that offers kind of discounts. Um, and you don't want to be like the, uh, the store that doesn't offer, <laughs> I guess, military uh, discounts um, or, or not be seen patriotic or, um, you know, eventually it would be like one of those, um, like after 9-11, you had like, all those flags and it eventually becomes a race. You can pin on the most, the most uh, American lapel pins on their suit jacket. Um, so I, I think it's uh, the best way maybe perhaps to showcase a lot of this stuff is to show them the sober uh for a while, it was illegal, or they try to stop showing photos of the soldiers returning back home in uh, boxes. Uh, and they try to stop reporters from uh, showing showcases that. I think what helped end the uh, Vietnam War was the visceral uh, bleeding of a lot of these people and, and those images coming back home. And a lot of that stuff is not really seen now. I think uh, maybe uh, having more visceral effect of uh, showcasing like those uh, drone bombers that kill civilians and families and uh, hospitals and weddings uh, that happens um, might, might help. But I think uh, reminding them that, uh, you know, if the measure of success of like joining the military to defend our freedoms, you know, then you just kind of bring that up and say, well, how many have our freedoms been uh, promoted or added onto or subtracted, right? Or have been taken away. And since 9-11, it seems to be quite innumerable of them. And so you can just kind of put that case to rest and that uh, is not really defending our freedoms, right? Again, as uh, um, Daniel McAdams was saying, you just go to an airport and you can see a lot of that already padded away, so to speak. 
Justin, one thing you and I share in common, I was really proud when I got my letter from the United States Coast Guard Academy saying that I had received an appointment there. And uh, 18 months later, I realized life at sea wasn't for me. So I dropped out. Uh, but if I had stayed, I would have been graduating right around the time 9-11 came about. And uh, I've done, I've gone, you know, the other way, such a 180 that if either of my boys decided to join a military academy, I think I'd nearly have to uh, disown them or you know, drag them to Canada. I don't know what I would do. But uh, same question to you, you know, that I posed to Cal. You're a conscientious objector, yet you graduated from the Air Force Academy and you served in the Air Force. How would you try to reach the hearts and minds of loved ones to let them know, hey, this is not a path to go down? Oh, I think we may have lost your, your audio, Justin. Sorry, how do you, you guys got me now? Yeah, we got you. Sorry about that. So I, I think the uh, key thing is that most people don't have too much of an issue fighting in a war, even if it's in self-defense. And that's the key distinction that we miss in our country. So we have a huge advantage in the United States uh, in that we have two enormous oceans that border uh, our left and right. And we have a super friendly country to the north and another super friendly country to the south. Uh, and there's virtually zero threat of anyone attacking us. So we really don't need to do anything in terms of the military, except maybe have a few ships outside the coast that in the rare circumstance that someone, you know, came over to mess with someone's neighborhood, uh, you could repel them, I suppose. But, um, you know, the, the real problem is that uh, people's beliefs have changed about what self-defense means. And instead of being a no kidding strict um, application of something like the non-aggression principle, where unless you're actually attacked, you're not morally permitted to use violence. Uh, now we, you know, have more people in general have um, put up with the government saying things like, you know, we have a moral responsibility to go and impose our will on other nations, which is absurd. And it, it leads to uh, a lot of unintended consequences or maybe intended consequences that are negative uh, for a lot of innocent people. Um, I think the interesting thing, though, is that, you know, we've been in an endless war, not since 9-11, but really since World War I. Um, basically correlating with the institution of the Federal Reserve. So what really needs to happen, in my view, is that you need to emancipate um, money from the government. That is the largest problem that is driving not only culture, but war and peace and um, character as an individual and whatnot in society. And that the government having a monopoly privilege to print money, it is able to disproportionately influence people towards uh, state violence and militarism and empire because it steals insidiously the wealth of the entire population and uses it um, to instigate different things that, like I said in the beginning, malinvestments that wouldn't otherwise occur in society. So someone like myself who would otherwise have been a peaceful farmer or a builder or something in my life is drawn towards um, some military adventure that's entirely unnecessary and that is made possible because the government doesn't have to tax its citizens, which would cause pushback. Instead, it's just able to print and um, bear the cost via inflation to the entire society, which is a lot more insidious and more difficult to notice. Thank you for echoing my intro there with the make gold money again coffee mug, right? If we had sound money, if we didn't have QE and ZERP, if Americans had to actually pay for these wars, they wouldn't reach too far into their pockets. And hopefully that would bring it to an end. Uh, I want to get to a question here for Daniel because it is very topical. Uh, you do a great job of praising President Trump when he's done well and eviscerating him when he's done wrong. Uh, he did something recently. I wanted to get your take. And so does Chris of the KF Elite. Thoughts on the removal of the National Security Advisor? Uh, yeah, first, I would just like to, to, to thank Justin for really hitting the core of the issue which is the Federal Reserve. And, you know, uh, the Institute for Peace and Prosperity focuses on peace, but the core issue is the Fed. Without the Fed, there would not be a national security state and there would not be endless wars. So we need to cut, uh, strike to the root, and that is the root. Uh, but the issue of Bolton is interesting, you know, and there's, there was a tendency, and, and Dr. Paul and I were in the studio yesterday morning when we heard it, and we both kind of, you know, had a big smile and were feeling gleeful about it. <clears throat> But then again, my inner Eeyore took over and I realized that it's not necessarily good news. Um, <clears throat> we hope, we try to be optimistic, 
uh, you know, it, it, if, if we just wanted to attack Trump and say there's no use, then so what's the point? <clears throat> Even with Obama, we encouraged when he did good things like Cuba and the Iran deal. So we have to hope that there is an inner Trump, that there is something there uh, that wants to carry out uh, the promises he made as a candidate that resonated with America. With getting rid of Bolton, well, first of all, he, he, can you imagine having an, uh, uh, someone under you who was, who was cr at cross purposes with you and actively trying to undermine uh, what you were trying to do in a business, you'd be gone in a day. There's no question about it. So, but with Bolton gone, there is an opportunity for someone who more uh, who, who reflects better uh, Trump's angels, maybe the angel on his right shoulder rather than the devil on his left, if there is such a thing. Uh, but there's also a huge danger, and the danger is that Bolton and his mustache were very easy to hate and very easy to point at. And it was almost like shorthand. Oh, yeah, Bolton. Oh, yeah, we know that guy. Uh, and the danger is, and this is kind of the Hegelian dialectic, right? So the synthesis is a Bolton who's not a Bolton, right? Uh, 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 Charles, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, what's his name now? The, the acting, uh, who was a deputy under Bolton, who was Bolton's advisor for 30 years. The synthesis, the danger is the synthesis in the dialectics, right? So you have someone who doesn't have a target on his back, like Bolton, but who has the same policies as Bolton, and who will repopulate the second and third tiers of the National Security Council staff, which is not regulated uh, in terms of its, 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 its size. It can be 400, it can be 40. So you can have basically a kind of a private secret CIA, uh, NSA kind of organization that can do whatever the hell it wants. Remember, these are the guys, the National Security Council at least, are the ones who decide on the kill list. So if you get someone like a Kupperman uh, or someone even less known who was exactly the same as Bolton without the mustache and the high profile, they can do probably more damage with less scrutiny because most of America that has, the, you know, that has sort of a moral compass is going, whew, we got rid of Bolton. Now let's move on to something else. Our kids got a little league game or whatever. Let's move on. And that's the real danger. Scott, I imagine you want to comment on the Bolton firing slash resignation as well. Yeah, sure. Well, actually, I'd rather comment on the Fed first again, just like Dan. Uh, what Justin said, it's all important. And then, but always remember, it's not just inflation. It's that boom bust cycle, too. So, yeah, they're paying for the war and they're making it seem free. But then we have an economic catastrophe every 10 years where people are spending, you know, people are blowing their brains out. That's their share of the cost of the war in Iraq. It's, you know, they kill their kids and their wife and themselves. Their business is destroyed. They're, you know, uh, they drink themselves to death and they're, or, or uh, shoot up themselves to death while their kids go to foster care. Uh, you know, society is torn over this kind of economic catastrophe. And where did, you know, the last crash came from? As obvious as it could be, when Bush came in, it was the Clinton recession. Hey, I just got here. This is the Clinton recession, which was true. But then, because you know, you had the Nasdaq and the stock market crash. But then, and September 11th happened, right at the financial district, and hit the airlines and all these things. So you would have an even deeper recession because of that. So what did Alan Greenspan do? He made interest rates nothing, and he built up the giant housing bubble to make essentially the middle class feel like they're getting rich off of essentially welfare. The value of their house is going up and up and up and up as it gets older and older and rained on and rained on. And so they think everything is fine while they, while the entire empire gets away with bloody murder and starting not just one, but two, three, four extra wars. And then they come to find out, they don't really find out. Then they suffer the costs in terms of, disruption to their lives, their businesses, their families, and all of these things, and all their time spent in the unemployment line. And that's their cost of the war. And they never find out. And then we do it again, and we do it again, and do it again. So, you know, they're, I just want to echo what both of them are saying about how important it is that, you know, as uh, I think Dan said, they can't, or, or Justin said, they cannot tax that much. Think if George Bush said, look, okay, Osama got away, but look, we want to go ahead and go to Iraq, okay? And what we're going to do, though, is we're going to raise your taxes. Everybody's going to pay a couple thousand extra this year so that we can go to Iraq. That would have been the end of that. Instead, they said, don't worry, oil will pay for it. The Federal Reserve will pay for it. Infl you know, inflation will pay for it. It'll be fine. 
And that's the way they keep getting away with this over and over again. And then as far as Dan saying about the endless list of hawks in line for the national security advisor job, there's no question about it. I mean, in fact, you know, unbeknownst to the president, there's probably one good bench of anti-war right wingers who are credentialed enough that they could have the job. Right. Like you could have Rand Paul for secretary of state. You could have Jim Webb for secretary of defense. You could have Doug McGregor for national security advisor, Bandau for uh, deputy national security advisor, put uh, Basevich in as chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Uh, You know, get creative. Put in Paul Pilar as the director of national intelligence. Um, You know, fine. I'm trying to think of another good CIA guy off the top of my head. Find one more good head, you know, former CIA guy to run the CIA, and then you have a consensus right there. Uh, you know, um, here, here are guys, none of whom are left-wingers, none of whom are liberals, none, none of whom are socialists, none of whom carry any of that baggage. Oh, you can put Stockman in at Treasury. Don't let me yep. leave him out. And here's a bunch of guys who don't want to bomb Iran. Here's a bunch of guys who do want to get the hell out of Somalia. Mr. President, you want out of Somalia? We want out of Somalia. No one disagrees. Let's get out of Somalia, and it's done in a week. And Trump could hire these men. The, those names I just rattled off, that's a realistic bench worth of guys. But all it would take would be for Donald Trump to read the national interest. But he doesn't. And so he doesn't know who they are. He's never heard of them. And he's never going to do it. You know? And so we're stuck. It's going to be Kupperman or whoever next. You know, Fred Flights or some monster. Uh, I do know. And I second all those names and a shout out to Doug McGregor. Got the chance to hear him speak because Daniel prepared well for this year's RPI conference. And uh, coincidentally, his speech was posted today on the uh, RPI channel. So go over there and check it out. It uh, was an excellent one. But we got a question here for you, Cal. Uh, I'm glad we're on the topic of the Fed and money. I mean, that's what the show is all about. Uh, we got a question from Gene asking about, look, if the dollar continues to get weak and then ultimately loses reserve status, don't you think that could potentially lead to less wars? Uh, well, I want to harp on a moment of silence for John Bolton, of course, <laughs> and a moment of silence for uh, World Trade Center number seven. You know, never forget that one. <laughs> and uh, before I go into that question, I guess in terms of, uh, well, it kind of ties up into the Fed that we were just talking about as well, uh, the inability to kind of fund a lot of these uh, expeditionary kind of war and terror sort of military campaigns in the Middle East. Yeah, bring back, um, get out of the Middle East, uh, get out of Europe. <laughs> why do we still have bases in Germany? Uh, get out of Japan. Why, why are we still there? I'm sure by now, if we had the unseen, the unbuilt, uh, would have been uh, mech robots, right? Um, but I think uh, some of the uh, unseen costs that a lot of people look at, like even if you get out of the Federal Reserve and go to something that's gold back, and sometimes uh, it says that uh, you you you'll inevitably raise the taxes. People will feel that, and people wouldn't want to go to war. Uh, otherwise, lest you become a, a bankrupt state, and uh, there is a historical precedence for that. You could look at France, um, for example, and their intervention in the American Revolution. Uh, I mean, it's great that they helped out. Right, people will say that's great that we we won that, uh, but I think that maybe we shouldn't have won that without their assistance because their assistance and giving us uh, and spending all that gold and spending a lot of their own uh, economy to the America here led them to collapse, led the state to collapse, led to the French Revolution, led to the wholesale onslaught horror of uh, Catholics, Christians, uh, being genocided, uh, hundreds of thousands. And the way they would murder these people, men and women and children naked, put into boats and sunk uh, to drown. Uh, and so that was that's the cost effects of like state intervention is even if it's not backed by the Federal Reserve. Um, so you find like, even with the good intention of a state intervening in the behalf of another state that there's still uh, backlash. There's still things that do occur within their own state. Um, like the situation in Hong Kong, a lot of them are asking for like uh, Trump to intervene, but I think it's great that they're taking their own mantle and kind of carving out their own destiny with, uh, without any costs at our, ourselves, right? Maybe private interests to show them how to 3D print guns, for example, but not at uh, our expenses, at our economy, with our, with our people here. Um, I think people don't look uh, on that side of it, that uh, even with the uh, gold pack standard and trying to intervene can have a horrible uh, back backlash within our own economies, just like France did. And of course, if France didn't, he- France didn't help and we did lose that war, and inevitably we would have gone into another war and gotten out, but at least our attitude towards the English would have been more of anger, more of um, 
uh, hatred that we wouldn't have helped him, for example, in World War I, and we would have stayed out of it. And then, of course, somebody here was making a comment of that being the start of the escalation, so like being a war in perpetuity, and maybe that could have changed uh, history, right? Our lack of involvement in World War I would have prevented World War II, you could say. Right, and who knows how we've managed to change history now with this endless war. Justin, I was uh, relieved and excited to find out that you're a Bitcoin enthusiast like myself. I think you probably gravitated toward it for the same reason that I did. Possibly a chance for transparent sound money. Uh, talk about the idea that you know if we did end up with sound money again, maybe it could end some of these uh, military excursions. Well, wow, yeah. So this is an awesome topic. I'm super excited about the potential. No telling what will actually happen in the future. I'm not a future teller, but I really understand the principles and I'm super excited about the possibility that it's something uh, in the world of money that has been put out there by an entrepreneur without asking permission from anybody that's being adopted by the market in a typical market adoption fashion and is blowing up and may not be stoppable. And, and I think the most exciting thing about it is that it's going to have certain features uh, that gold doesn't have. So things that make it superior to um, the best money of all time, that is, that is previously uh, gold. Uh, and in particular, the fact that it has potential to evade capture by governments. So uh, if you haven't read Safety and Amos's book yet, I highly recommend that. Uh, the Bitcoin Standard, it's phenomenal. And he has a very good grasp of Austrian economics, but most importantly, um, time preference uh, as an individual and how important that is uh, to human society and culture and your own virtue and character as a person. So um, I'm rooting for Bitcoin. Uh, we'll see what happens, no telling, but it is super exciting in that uh, the principles are there. It's digital, so you can use it in the modern era um, without you know, the need to send a bunch of payments across oceans that can be extremely expensive. Like if you were to settle payments in gold, that's extremely expensive. Now you're using electricity. So it meets with the uh, modern era, but it also has a limited supply, probably the most important feature. And then all the other important characteristics of money, you know, it's fungible. Um, it's comes out out of the market. People are, you know, finding a need for it on its own, not being imposed on someone uh, as in fiat money. So there's a million things to uh, talk about and I'm super excited about it. So yeah, let's hope it, uh, let's hope it takes off. And if, if not, um, maybe someone else will come up with something even better and, and that'll take over. So there's room yeah, to be I'll hopeful. Yeah, I'll second that book for sure. Saifedean, we had him on before. If folks want to dig through the uh, KF archives, they can uh, see his debate with Michael Pento. People really enjoyed that. Uh, tremendously. It's all about low time preferences. Good cultures have low time preferences. Dr. Paul says we're going to suffer a moral bankruptcy because most of our citizens have a high time preference and that moral bankruptcy is going to lead toward our financial bankruptcy. So Daniel, let's uh, wrap it up here. Final thought here on the 18th Memorial of 9-11 and uh, where folks can obviously find you if they don't know where you are already. Well, we're at ronpaulinstitute.org. The Ron Paul Liberty Report is broadcast live at noon Eastern time every Monday through Friday on YouTube, Ron Paul Liberty Report. Uh, and we're very happy to have uh, 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 many viewers and readers. I would just go back to the beginning and mention a couple of other things that haven't been mentioned. Uh, the moral costs of our wars, and we've, we've touched on it a little bit. And as uh, our, our good friend Jacob Hornberger has written many times, uh, he believes strongly, and I, and I can't uh, disagree with him, that the, the shootings that we see, the mass shootings, the violence in our society, uh, the hatred, the anger, uh, the street violence, is all caught up in a generation at constant war. We've come to believe that violence is the solution to our problems rather than looking inside, and that's a real problem. And finally, the indirect costs of war, which we haven't gone into, and maybe we'll, we'll meet again to talk about this, but it's really the sort of uh, the Bastiat thing uh, uh, instead of what. Uh, and, you know, I, I happen, this happens to hit close to home because I have a son uh, who is an aerospace engineering major in a major university where this is a, a top major. And uh, if you don't believe that this uh, field of discipline is dominated by uh, the death machine, uh, you're, you're deluding yourself. Uh, and we've raised our son. 
you know, with strong values, and he knows that he's not to pursue uh, a career, however lucrative it may be, that results in uh, the, 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 the advance of the war machine and the destruction of mankind. But imagine if this money, these trillions we spent on war uh, in something like aerospace engineering and something like uh, transportation uh, and all of the technologies that could have made our lives better, that could have lifted people from poverty and helped people become self-sufficient, which have, could have contributed to charities to help those that are less fortunate. If all that money had not been poured into the death machine, into the ridiculous think tanks in Washington and have been really poured to the betterment of our society. Just think where we would be now. And it's really such a tragedy. Uh, and I hope that uh, all of us doing our best can, can try to help turn it around. Scott, your final thought and where folks can find you. Oh, well, I can't do any better than that. I mean, I think that's really right. I look back on the 21st century, and, you know, essentially it didn't have to be this way at all. In fact, I think the obvious counterfactual, right, is never even mind Al Gore. But what if you just, instead of having Cheney and Rumsfeld and Wolfowitz and the neocons, what if Bush Jr. had simply just had Colin Powell, his secretary of state, to be his major counselor on foreign policy? In that case, the terror war would have never happened. I mean, we probably would have had an occupation of Afghanistan. Uh, but we would have not gone to Iraq and none of the rest of these dominoes that have been falling down and all the million people killed and all the chaos spread would never have happened if it had just been Colin Powell calling the shots, which, by the way, he did lie us into war and he did go along with it. And it's just as guilty as hell. But I'm just saying it was not his policy. And, and he certainly was not in the driver's seat on that and would not have recommended it. So, in other words, we are just a hair away from living an entirely different reality. The whole 21st century didn't have to be this way at all. And, and it was all really for nothing and it should be called off immediately. And that's all I got to say about that. Can we plug your debate with Bill Crystal or are we not allowed to talk about that yet? Yeah, no, it's fine. In fact, if we're going to do a plug, thanks for saying that word because I'm going to instead announce that today is the day I'm furiously refreshing Amazon, you know, back in here thing, because uh, today is the day that my new book is coming out. It's called the great Ron Paul. The Scott Horton Show Interviews, 2004 through 19. It's the transcripts of 38 interviews I did of Ron Paul this whole time, and uh, including uh, when I was a guest on him and Dan's show, The Liberty Report, a couple years ago, and including my speech that I gave last November all about the greatness of Ron is in there too. And uh, it's called The Great Ron Paul, and a friend of mine's wife did a beautiful job. Uh, Sarah DeYoung is her name, did a beautiful job on this uh, pencil sketch of Ron, this charcoal sketch of Ron for the cover art. And it's just great. And wait, let me hit refresh right now. Is it live yet? No, but soon. <laughs> By the time anyone sees the rerun of this, it'll be up there on Amazon.com. The great Ron Paul. Check it out. You'll love it. And it's so good. Good deal. Cal, final thought and where folks can find you. Uh, yeah, I mean, there are hidden costs. Uh, there's one interesting one that this came out recently in terms of, um, I guess you can see like the uns and the, the things we should have built, the things that uh, the economy should have been better directed at in terms of like not just human, but resources. But there's something that came out that like uh, showed that government was holding back uh, cell phone technology for 40 years. Right. I'm sure that could have been very useful uh, by now, you could say, uh, especially seeing uh, the advancement of uh, that kind of technology. Um, but yeah, it doesn't take... Um, Courage to sign a piece of paper and sign away your life for four years. Uh, it doesn't take courage uh, to do that, which is why often they kind of go out to high schools and places and kind of trick them to seeing that they're going to see the world and uh, do something awesome. Um, in my case, that wasn't particularly the case. <laughs> uh, but yeah, they, when, when you're in the military, though, when you're trying to get out, it's interesting that they will sometimes tell you the, that you don't want to get out. They'll show you a comparison of uh, the cost. Uh, like, here's how much you're making in the military and how much you're getting through... Um, uh, through the VA and through the, uh, th to, the, uh, to the food, through all these different costs and they compare it to the civilian world and they try to tell you that there's nothing comparable out there and it's your best situation is to re-enlist and stay in. Um, but that's, again, it doesn't take courage to kind of do that. It does take courage to kind of go out there and make your own mark and actually make a living, uh, an honest living, right? And that's not off of a um, tax expense living of other people's backs. Uh, I think that takes courage and that takes a lot of work to do that. I think that's where a lot of the attention of people who join the military are thinking that's what's going to give them uh, honor or some kind of courage. You know, they, they go to high schools to get these kids to sign up. Right. So that it's not particularly a courageous thing to do. Um, whereas uh, carving out your own life and um, being productive, going the private field, 
uh, is courageous. Uh, we can find myself at uh, my web, my YouTube site, uh, Cal Molone, and uh, we'll also have a podcast, Libertarian Crusaders. Uh, kind of like the hospitalers, we're kind of helping guide this uh, pilgrimage to the Holy Land. We help uh, guide uh, people, libertarians, to uh, an order society. Yep, that's a great show. I got the link for you, uh, your YouTube channel there in the description box below. Justin Pavoni, final thought, and uh, where folks can find you if you want to be found. Maybe you don't want to be found <laughs> with the farming and things like that. You're too busy. Yeah. Um, so first, if I uh, if I can, while I have the platform, I just would love to plug uh, Selective Objection uh, as a thing that we should all support. It's super important. So just like Scott mentioned that taxes create a resistance vis-a-vis -vis money printing, i.e. someone in government has to say, hey, we want to go to this war. Will you give us 5,000 bucks? And someone would be much more inclined to say, absolutely not. That's ridiculous. I'd rather spend that on a new TV. Thank you very much. No thanks to the war. Um, just like that, it would be super, super helpful for the cause of peace if soldiers were allowed to say, no thanks. This war sucks. I'm not interested in fighting. I don't believe in this particular war. This war is dumb. Um, it doesn't add up with my moral principles rather than having to say, I believe all war is wrong all the time, you know, in some hypothetical, all encompassing statement that really doesn't apply to the real world. So you need to legalize selective objection, which basically creates that same resistance amongst people in the military, i.e. it would be very powerful if someone was trying to invade Iraq and half of the soldiers just said, nope, I don't think this is worthwhile. I'm not going. And one soldier could have an influence on the other soldiers and say, you shouldn't go either. This is wrong. Here's why. Let's opt out. Um, so I think that would be huge. Um, and it's something worth talking about more. So with that in mind, if anyone's interested in like writing a book or doing anything like that, uh, please find me. I would love to work on a project like that. And I know a little bit about it. Um, so you can reach out to like Scott or Daniel and they can put you in touch with me. Uh, with regards to my own personal social media stuff, I've got a five-year plan. So I'll be out there in like a while. But right now, I'm working on raising three young kids and uh, we got other stuff going on besides um, talking about all these evil institutions that I really don't care about too much. Yep. Well, that's uh, even more important. And that's why we do the show at eight o'clock because I got two of my own here. If I can give a shameless plug to myself as well, obviously the Fed and gold spoken about a lot this evening. The Fed and sound money got another round table next week before Jerome Powell makes the announcement that'll shock the world, lowering interest rates again because Keynesianism doesn't work. Surprise, surprise. Zerp and QE, they're going to have to go back to the well. So we're going to have Michael Pento, Lawrence Lepard, Jerry Robinson, and Dave Kranzler to share their thoughts. That'll be Wednesday at noon Eastern time, two hours before Jerome Powell comes out. So uh, be ready for that. Mm -hmm.